and we can begin. Sure. Um, good afternoon, teachers. Uh, welcome to our special session today. And I'm really, really honored as well as privileged to uh, invite Catherine Mam and her uh, to our session today. So little, I'll just give an introduction to who is Harmeet Ma'am and Catherine. So Harmeet Ma'am is the co-founder of organization Include, Inclusion. If I'm correctly pronouncing it, yes? Yes, Inclusion. Okay. Inclusion, okay. A social responsible enterprising supporting parents and all stakeholders with inclusion across United Arab Emirates. Harmeet Ma'am has worked in Dubai for the last 30 years in the in the field of inclusion. She has worked tirelessly to support and train stakeholders to promote inclusion in school. And we have attended, actually our inclusion team has been attending a lot of sessions and we have been very thankful towards the wise uh, words that she has imparted on us. Now, oh, Catherine thank you. Ma <laughs> uh, Catherine, ma um, Catherine Ma'am is an experienced educational leader as well as a consultant. She is the founding partner of Inclusion and hosts an international forum for inclusion and well-being leader. Catherine Ma'am holds a lot of degrees, including psychology and masters in uh, counseling and psychotherapy. With 16 years of experience in international ed education, Catherine Ma'am has served as a director, as a group head for a number of large and school groups. Actually, my association with Catherine Ma'am has been from Athena Group. So, and she has been giving us a lot of solutions to things that we needed that support from. Um, she is a huge advocate for special education and inclusion. Welcome, Ma'am. And uh, hopefully we have a very informative as well as fruitful session. I hope so. I hope so. And thank you all very much for having me. Um, today's session, though brief, we hope it will be informative and somewhat interactive. So please, can I ask everybody to open your chat boxes and be ready to answer some questions? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll monitor. I'll monitor the chat box, and we will um, we'll make sure that you know we get your questions answered. Amazing, amazing. So as we were saying, we're from inclusion and our core body of work is improving inclusive practice in schools across the Emirates and the MENA region. And we are working with more than 30 strategic partners at the moment under the umbrella of the Global Sustainability Network, working towards uh, sustainable employment and meaningful outcomes, improved outcomes for students. So our, um, our talk today is going to look at what real inclusion is and how we can implement effective inclusion in our classrooms. So we're going to begin with a question. And if you wish to call out, no problem. Raise your hand. You can answer freely. I don't mind. Or answer in the chat. Our first question, what percentage of students in general are identified as having special educational needs? Right, there's no right or wrong answer. Just give it a try and see what happens. No judgment. And you can guess whatever your guess is or what your experience is. Let's try. I hope everyone's chat is enabled. Okay, 3% Pooja, thank you. Okay, Marshall, 10%. Debolina, five, Shafak, 10, Hina, 5%. Najani, 15, 15%. Alia says five. Fatima said 2%. Well done, guys. Good try. Anybody else wants to put in any answers? Alia says 5%. Okay, so on average, in countries where we have robust findings like the UK, the, U the US and across Europe, the UN and the WHO average this out as in and around 12% of students who have individual needs. So those who are up around 10% to 15, really good guess. 
Now, those of you who are guessing between two and 5%, you're looking at regionally specific numbers. Here in the UAE, we are only identifying on average somewhere in around 5%. So you've, you've a very good guess for this region. Now, what percentage of students would be gifted or talented? Let's have another guess. What percentage do you think are gifted and talented? And again, whatever your guess is, it's worthwhile guess. So put whatever you think down. Have a good think about that. Gifted and talented, that's not a, a well-developed area, but it's getting there. I think there's now a lot more focus on it than there was before. Okay, Pretty seven, uh, Vandana, five, Nazreen, 10, Shafak, four, Fatima, five, um, Priya, 15. Okay, so on average, gifted and talented, which are separate from inclusion send, gifted and talented would be up and around 10% of the average population. We, Harmeet and I just came from a meeting with the Sharjah Private Education Authority this morning. We were talking to them about gifted and talented. And on average in the UAE, we're only looking at around one to 3%. So the, our identification here is very low. Now, what percentage of students, and we'll see if who's, who's in the know here, what percentage of students at Arab Unity are yeah, identified? I'm yes. so sorry, I'm interrupting you. Uh, we're just reclaiming the host so that we can uh, admit a lot of people who have joined in right now. Uh, okay. Your share, sharing will happen simultaneously. I can admit them all, I can admit them here. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. I'm good at multitasking. Right, so what percentage of students at Arab Unity are identified as needing an IEP? And let's see what, any guess, give a, a guess according to what your experience is. So we have 4%, 5%. 5%, okay. Try to have a think about your register or rather what your head of inclusion has shared with you. 5%, 5%. Ah, Firdaus is 12%. Alias, 3 Nazrin is 15%. Priya is 7%. Shana says 10%. Okay. At our community, across all tiers of inclusion, you guys are identifying around 9% of students. But of those students, those who have an actual diagnosis, we're looking at in and around 1%. So what, that, what does that mean for inclusion at Arab Unity? Have a think about that and I'm gonna come back to you. And then final question, before I go back to the, the idea around 1% identified with a report, what percentage of people with special needs gain meaningful employment after their education? Give a guess, what percentage do we have? <clears throat> so these are students we have supported through school or through all sorts of training when we send them out to the real world. How many do you think actually get a job? Okay, pretty 12%. Anybody else? Okay, Fatima, 10%, uh, 25%, below 50%, Saruchi, 25%. Okay, the actual figure from the EU, where we've got quite robust findings, is in and around 10%. So you guys were guessing pretty well, 10%. So think about that. Of all of the students who have special needs, when they graduate from school or university, only one in 10 of those kids is going to get a job, that they, a meaningful job that will last and pay them a decent salary. Now, if we are only identifying between one and 3% of students, that means we have got over 90% of our students are going undiagnosed. That means they are going without support and they are contributing to those students who are qualifying 
and not gaining meaningful employment. So if you think and step back from just education and think about the bigger picture for your economy, for your global economy, and for the families of those people who are graduating, their chances of employment are really low if we don't, number one, identify them, and number two, support them accurately. So that's what we need to think about. For every student we meet who has a special need, what are we doing to increase our percentages of identification and increasing their chances of getting a job when they leave our school and our care? Okay, so Ms. Harmi, do you want to take this slide? Yeah. So now coming back to what Ms. Catherine has said. So basically we are looking at removing barriers. So the end purpose of whatever we are doing in inclusion, the reason we have inclusion in the first place, the reason we are supporting these students is to remove the barriers, to remove the barriers so that they become a part of the social fabric. So what is your role as a teacher and LSA in supporting the students of determination. So not only are we looking at the role of the teacher, but we also need to look at the role of the LS, LSA, who is the one who works the closest with these students. Now, Ms. Catherine and I have been doing lots of support and forum for the LSAs. And the reason we specifically targeted LSAs is because they are our first contact with our students of determination. And we realize that they have a wealth of data and knowledge that we have failed to harvest. So that's the reason why we are targeting very, very uh, intensely on them. It's to encourage them to have a voice so that we can harvest their knowledge. We don't give them enough credit. So legislation. So what is the le legislation that is in place? What are the policies that have been set up? How are you as a school keeping in line with policies? Policies are roadmaps that allow you to plan how you want to go forward with your inclusion. It gives you an idea that this, this, these are the areas I need to work on. So whether you are in uh, SLT, whether you are a head of inclusion or whether you are a class teacher, Legislation is what you need to understand so that you know this is, these are the expectations and this is what I need to do to reach those expectations. Then we come back to school. From uh, Legislation talks about it, a big picture. Now we need to narrow it down to school expectations. Every school is individual. We have schools with different barriers, students with different needs, whether it is for uh, SEND, whether it's for GNT, but every child is an individual. There is no one fit all program. You can take a general roadmap, but you will have to create your own little parts. So your school expectations are very important because they then help you to understand what you are expected, what is expected of you as a, a teacher as an inclusion teacher or as a classroom uh, teacher. Now, one of the biggest uh, mistakes that we make is that as a classroom teacher, we think, oh, it's got nothing to do with me. This is inclusion department. No, the whole philosophy of inclusion is every teacher and inclusion teacher. So if you start to practice as an inclusion teacher, not only will the students of determination benefit, but the other typical students in the class will as well, because what you will do is you will scaffold their learning, which will then also help with the others. And you will set the pathway showing your students that inclusion is a norm. There's nothing to worry about. Look, I've made this child a part of the learning and we can all do that together. And of course, your ethical obligation. We are all as teachers, we have taken the oath to do the best for our students, that we will give them the best support, making learning most accessible for them and making them a part, very, very, very important, making them a part of the classroom, of the school and allowing them to feel their worth in the school and the classroom. Okay, so looking at these three pillars of inclusive practice, we have legislation, school expectation, 
and ethical obligations. Now, looking at legislation, here in the UAE, there are very clear guidelines as to our expectations as practitioners and general society, any citizens. First is uh, federal law number three of 2016, which is Wadima's law, protecting the rights of the child. Every child in the UAE has the right to an education and the right to safety and protection. Um, and within that is encompassed inclusive education. So as providers of education, we are obliged to teach every child. So it, no matter what child comes to you, we have that obligation in this country. Now, there's also the national agenda. We are expected to be performing in the 15 highest countries on the international benchmarking assessments, TIMS and PISA in the top 20%. The UAE has a very, very clear structure towards this advancement. And part of that is the school's inspection framework. We're subjected in schools to very rigorous expectations and rigorous inspection as to what good practice looks like. We also have attainment, working toward improved outcomes for all of our students, whether they have individual needs or whether they are gifted and talented. Making inclusion really practical and possible also involves teacher retention, teacher recruitment. If you're trained and practiced in an inclusive environment, you're, you're gonna be practicing as a happier teacher. It just makes life so much easier. We also have alumni tracking. Where are our students going when they graduate from our school? Are they going to good universities? Do they have that access because we have given them really good quality education? So we should have these questions in our mind all the time. Are we abiding by the expectations of the country? Are we improving outcomes for students? Are our teachers happy and trained? And are our students graduating with real opportunity? Okay, so the second pillar are our school, uh, school expectations. Ms. Harmeet, do you want to speak to this one? Yeah, okay. So basically, it, as you can see, the diagram explains itself. So your input, is going to be your vision and your governance. Governance. So, what is the vision of the school? What are you? Uh, what do you want to attain? If, of course, eventually, following what the UAE government has set in place, inclusion has taken a big step forward. It's become a very important part of the whole process because inclusion, at the end of the day is what is required so that every child gets a chance to be a part of the school. Your learning environment, what are you going to create? What sort of learning environment are you going to create? Is it going to be a teacher-led, um, uh, um, interactive, collaborative um, teaching environment, your learning environment? Is it going to be one where the teacher stands as a general and goes like, you're going to learn this, 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 or are you going to have different ways of learning are you going to allow the children to become a part of your in your learning environment again if you look at what inclusion is all about it is allowing a student voice so it comes back to a learning environment in the classroom where you want everyone to be a part of class of the classroom you know i what i constantly hear from teachers is that but miss he can't learn he can't learn how do you know he can't learn? Did you ever give him a chance to try to be a part of the learning process? No, you haven't. Just because you think he can't learn doesn't mean that he can't learn. Give him a chance, let him try, create a learning environment where it can be peer support. It can be a, a more able student supporting a not so able student, that sort of learning environment or a learning environment where um, the child is not afraid to take part and then we have our state and national curriculum. Of course, in Dubai, we know we have a variety of uh, different curriculums. And some curriculums tend to be a little more rigid than other curriculums. But again, that does not mean that your learning styles and your classroom setup um, 
can be tweaked to suit what is required for a student. You start with the student, you end with the student because it's all about the student and his learning. It's not about you. And then building on students' prior knowledge and achievement. Now, it's, uh, this again comes back to where the teacher said, oh, he doesn't know anything and he can't learn. Have you ever examined what he knows? Have you ever had a chance to have a chat with him? Have you asked your LSA or have you asked the classroom assistant, any one of them who has worked with him? Have you asked the parents? Have you asked the inclusion team? What can they do? What does this, what is this child actually capable of? Remember, every teacher, an inclusion teacher. Um, and then using different resources. And then you talk about processes. You talk about teaching, assessment, leadership, self-evaluation, inclusion, curriculum mapping, teacher planning. These are all part of the processes that will then lead you to see an, out, an output that you desire, that as, as an educator, as a school, and every stakeholder wants to see this output, that they want to see an increase in the student achievement, which should reflect in the data. So, you know, throughout uh, your, your, your teaching, throughout the year, you are constantly asked to, um, to show data, validate your, um, you know, your claims with data. So your data should show the student outcomes when you create an, an environment that is conducive. And then you look at attainment and progress. You look at learning skills, your personal development, and then you include social cultural um, skills, your more the moral development and the innovation and enterprise. Anything else you want to add to that, Catherine? No, I think I think you've pretty much covered it. So we're looking at it very much like almost like a factory, for want of a better word. So we take children who have a lack of knowledge. We process them and we produce children who we hope have a full body of knowledge and not just knowledge, but a holistic approach where they have developed their social skills, emotional well being, and resilience. Now, right. the most so important part of this for us is the process. We as educators, we are part of the process. We mold that child. We create the environment where they can grow and blossom. Right. So just coming, building up on this factory uh, concept, it's a fantastic way of looking at it. So sometimes even in the factory, you'll find that some products are stuck because they can't go forward. So what do you do? You modify the, the, uh, the environment around that product to make it a little better. The same thing with our children. So you have to do the accommodations and the modification because at the end, we want this product to come out as best as they can be. Okay, so looking at the, the reason, the purpose behind our this, this training and any training you do, one of the foremost educational research bodies is the Education Endowment Fund, which is based in the UK, and they do meta-analysis on research internationally. So they take hundreds and hundreds of bodies of research every year, they collate them and they pick out the most impactful information for education. And this year, they have found that the most high impact um, uh, in intervention in a school for student outcomes is high quality teaching by double any other intervention. So yes, you can have targeted academic support. You may have broader strategies like after school activities or competition entry, but the most effective is high quality teaching. That is you and me, the person who is working with the child every single day. This is the biggest impact on improving student outcomes. Right. So now coming back to high quality teaching, high quality teaching is not something new. It's been around for a long time. So when you talk about high quality teaching in inclusion, what you are specifically talking about is you are talking about the classroom teacher providing the support in the class for any student that has a need. Any, any student, it doesn't just have to be a SEND student, it can be any student 
that has a need. How are you being the first point of contact? How are you providing for this child? So instead of it, another term for high quality teaching is quality first teaching. It used to be QFT. Now it's become a, a high quality teaching. So what are you doing to make this possible? So that's what they were talking about. So inclusion starts with the belief that all students have the right to feel safe, supported and included at school. It also allows students with different ability to share a truly integrated learning experience in the general classroom. So segregated classrooms where we put them in a little classroom and say, yeah, you're going to get specialized support. I'm going to be with you all day and I'm just going to be teaching you this. That's, it does not serve the purpose of inclusion. What we want is we want them in the classroom with the general population of the other students. It's again, peer learning. A lot of students with needs see the other child and they learn things that the other child doesn't need to be taught. Like for example, a child with autism, right? What do we constantly try to teach this child? personal space, personal space. This is your personal space. You have to respect. Now, if this child is seeing all the other students in the classroom modeling this behavior, then there will not be a great need to teach this child. You may have to just remind him once or twice, but as he looks around and he sees it in practice, he will pick it up uh, very quickly. All right, so I think this uh, this comic was amazing and I just loved it. So Catherine put it into the slide and it says, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Yeah. And this, this is what we do. <laughs> yes, Our, the, the very model of education that we use, whether you're in the UK, uh, CBSE or US curriculum, the model is very similar for all of them. And we expect the same actions and same outcomes for the class that's in front of us. But we must be mindful that every individual need needs individualized teaching. So your pedagogy has to be really flexible. That's where really inclusive practice becomes fine skill, fine, finely honed. So to do that in the classroom, practically, we can use accommodations and modifications. Accommodations change how a student accesses information and how they demonstrate their learning. Modifications change what a student is expected to do. So these are two very simple ways that we can allow a general curriculum to be accessible for students with differing needs. This is also, sorry, just coming back to that. Now, accommodations and modifications are a very simple they look like very simple terms to understand, but I, I've actually done a whole um, PowerPoint training on that. And um, what we, what I noticed as I was doing the training, because it was a learning lesson for me as well. It was a learning point for me. And I realized that accommodation and modifications were two separate things that I really needed to understand to see how I could implement it in the classroom and what were the different ways of doing it. I, as you know, I would recommend that you guys go and see what the difference is and learn a little bit more about it. It makes practicing in the classroom a lot better. And perhaps checking out what accommodations are suitable for the specific needs that you have in your class. Now, whenever I audit a school, I always ask these questions of the class teachers in order to get an understanding of how inclusion is viewed in a school. Do we celebrate our students' individual needs? Very often you see schools will be slow to talk openly about autism. They're slow to bring forward their children who have different needs like Down syndrome. Maybe they are physically impaired. We should be bringing these students forward and celebrating their abilities rather than focusing on their disabilities. So focusing very much on what they can do and what they're good at, good at really helps to build their whole contribution to the school community. So I would always ask nine questions of every teacher. 
What accommodations do you make? Are your SEND children valued and celebrated? Do they contribute to lessons? What's in your inclusion flowchart? How do you process children of determination in your school? And these nine questions, we should all be able to answer pretty quickly and pretty positively if you are operating in an inclusive classroom. So Ed, this is just to wrap up everything that we have been talking about. Now, if you look at these four models of uh, what inclusion looks like. So initially, when we started, um, this exclusion was the first model that we used to practice. I know that when I came here to the UAE, uh, it was very norm for the children to be outside the class all the time in separate classes, in fact, even in separate schools. So we had centers where I met some quite exceptional children with, with ability that should not have been there, who should have had a space in school, but because um, of the legislation, schools were allowed at that time to exclude these children. And then they moved to the separation model. Now, a lot of the MOE schools used to practice the separation model. So they would have a separate classroom for children with needs. And these children would stay in that classroom for all the time. And then we move to integration. Now, I think a lot of schools are now at the integration stage because we are allowing children into the classroom, but we tend to keep them together. So like, you know, oh yeah, you have this ability, so you stay together. However, through inclusion is when these children become a part of the classroom, a full on no uh, holes barred and where they're allowed to sit and do everything with the rest of the class. So these are eventually, this is where we want to get to. And hopefully in a few years, Inclusion will be a term that we don't have to use. It is just a natural progression of things. Okay, we are just about at time. And I believe that there are a lot of questions that you guys want to ask. So please feel free to ask us any questions. Over to you. Teachers, I request if you have any questions, please write it in the chat box. Um, Ma'am, we did ask uh, teachers to write some pre-request questions. And one of the questions that is uh, time and time again asked is that uh, in a classroom, what is an expectation of an LSA as well as what is an expectation of a teacher? Right, okay. So an LSA, is your learning support assistant. Now, an LSA and a teacher, first of all, must have a working relationship. So depending on the needs of the child. So if we have a child with profound needs, it is expected that the LSA will fully support that child with guidance from the teacher, but she will be doing a lot of the support with the child, with the, with the teacher directing her. There is no such thing as leaving the LSA to do things on her own with support from the class teacher, with support from the inclusion team. Now, what the LSA must be told from the beginning is that eventually your support will be intense. It will be a lot. But what we want to get to, the end product is we want an independent child. So you must work yourself out of a job. So now, depending on school uh, expectations you can have an LSA who can come in and I have seen this as well where she's just thrown to her own devices to do whatever she wants now that's not a not a good way to do because an LSA is a very good resource to use you can create a relationship where you can get your LSAs to work with you on your lesson planning if you are willing to integrate her into the planning into the daily planning where you can give her your lesson plan if, um, initially, you may need to show her how to modify the lesson plan. But if you can take that time to invest in her, you will get a lot of outcomes. So the many LSAs that we work with, we encourage them, ask the teacher for the lesson plans, tell the teachers your ideas. 
Now, explain to your teachers, be receptive. Remember, some of them may not be uh, as experienced as you are. And some of them may be even more qualified than you are. Because I have LSAs who have PhDs, right? But unfortunately, because of where they, are, where they come from, they're not able to get jobs as teachers. So they are, they are actually working as LSAs. Use, use their, their knowledge, tap into the, uh, into the resource and, and, tell, and ask them. So it's up to you how you want to build a relationship, but allow them, give them the respect they deserve. Um, just to uh, clarify the question again, uh, the LSAs that we refer to over here, you know, I, I'm sure Ms. Harmit, you were talking about the individual learning support assistance, or, uh, you know, that who are provided by the parents. In our school, the individual learning support assistance are provided by the parents, and they are the ones, uh, you know, who works one-on-one uh, -on -one with the student throughout the school day. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and I would like to, you know, uh, have your uh, take on uh, what the role of uh, LSA or a learning support teacher or learning support assistant, which is uh, by the school, you know, what would their role be when it comes to a, uh, to a classroom? So the school, a school employed LSA. Yes, yes. I mean, right. I mean so it's, 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 it's a, a part-time part -time support. It's like, uh, you know, going in and supporting only for, let's say, English and math. Right, so it's, it's the same thing. So what you do is that these LSAs will move uh, from, I'm assuming, at least three or four classes. Yeah. Right, so what you do is that once you have a set timetable for them and set responsibility for them, get them to build a relationship with the teacher. So the inclusion team will support that. They will build a relationship with the teacher. Again, give them the specific lesson plans for whoever they are supporting, be it two students, three students, give them the learning points, give them the targets of where these children should be and allow them the freedom to um, scaffold, to do the scaffolding. I encourage them to give them the, the um, um, access to resources which they can use. What the teacher can do here is that if she, if you, or rather as a school, if you have say 10 LSAs, Right. If every once a month you bring them in and talk and the inclusion team talks about uh, a different area of training once a month, it can be focused on this. It can be focused on whatever it is. So initially start um, on what your main barriers uh, or needs in the schools in the school are. So if you have a high percentage of students uh, with ASD, focus on developing their knowledge on ASD. What are you what are the strategies that you can use? Uh, how can you support them? So it's very important that they understand um, what, what are the strategies. Now, then tell them, now take those strategies back into the classroom. Out of these 10, which ones do you think would be applicable for group one? Which one would be applicable for that? But it's the same, it's the same principle. You can give them lesson plans, ask the teachers to work with them, allow them to... Uh, to give their input on how they can, uh, different uh, um, modifications that they can do to the lessons to help them, to help the, the, the child to uh, access the learning. So there's, there's actually, there's no difference between a one-to-one -one LSA and a, and a school-employed LSA. The only difference is that a school-employed LSA goes into different uh, classrooms to work with them. But if you focus it to say a particular grade or even two grades and keep them within that grade, they can then specialize in supporting children within that uh, area. So it's easier for them to do more, uh, more sort of planning for their support. And if I could add just a little bit to that, um, I think it's very important that we empower our LSAs. As Ms. Harmid was saying, we have got really good practitioners involve them in your classroom planning involve them ask for their ideas give them updates ensure that they are aware of your planning and something that so, we might think is um a given but very often doesn't happen make sure that your lsas have a copy of the ieps for the children with whom they're working because very often our lsas will slip through the cracks and they won't have an iep this is possibly the most important thing to share with your LSA, the IEP for the children with whom they're working. 
Okay, I think we're just about coming up to time, guys. It is one minute to go. Um, if we have perhaps one final question. You're on mute. Uh, yeah, one of the question is, if a child has a severe difficulty, how to include him or her in a group activity? Okay, this is very individual for each child. It depends on what the area of need is. Some children who have severe needs simply can't be integrated into groups, and that's okay. You need to understand that and allow the child to be excluded from that activity if that is an area of concern for them. For example, children who have high sensory sensitivity, being in a group is quite, quite really, it's torture for them. So we need to be mindful of what the need is. If you have a child who can be in a group but needs extra support, it's important to know what that support is. Talk to the group themselves and let them know this person needs extra time. This person needs to maybe see your lips when you're speaking. This person needs space. Let the group know this is how we will all work together. Utilize and mobilize your LSA to support the child as they integrate into the group and constantly ask for feedback and look what works on what what works for that child and then build on that. So this is where you can then look at all, you know, this is as an inclusion department. What you can do, like I said, is when you do your training for specific barriers, you can then tell the teachers, listen, this is a general guide, but you can use, um, you can modify some of these strategies and use them in the classroom. So if you are trying to include a child who, um, like you said, is struggling to be a part of a group, you can start with maybe one person. You can tell him to sit with one person, especially somebody who you can see is a compassionate uh, person who wants to be there. There are children who always want to be you know, they, they're just born to be doctors and nurses and teachers. You can see that, you know, like so many years of teaching. And immediately when I go into a classroom, I know who I can use to create this bond. So you can use start with one and then build up and you will always find somebody like that. Um, now, tomorrow evening, we have a forum for LSAs uh, and we are doing a second. We did a one before on ADHD part one. And tomorrow will be ADHD part two. So uh, I have shared the link with you in the chat. Um, also, um, if you would like to invite all your LSAs or any of the teachers as well are welcome to come on. Uh, and this is basically empowering our LSAs. This training that, we are, that you're going to see tomorrow is done by an LSA for LSAs. All the presenters are trained by us, supported by us, but they come up with the content. We just check through and guide them on maybe a little changes here and there, but they feel so empowered and they love the fact that they can come onto this platform and talk about, we've talked about many things. We have talked about speech. We have talked about uh, how to support uh, learning. And then now this one is uh, ADHD. Uh, and then our next one will be different, but it's all for LSAs, by LSAs. Ma, we would really like to thank you both for giving such an informative session and the words that you put across. I'm, I've, I've been writing notes from the uh, beginning till the end. Like there's so much of information that you've given. Um, Ma'am, uh, we would like to tell you that you've just given us that bigger cost, right? The inclusion, the well-being. You just just put like the pin on it and we will start keep giving that we'll keep on having those conversations and ensure that inclusion is a priority that is maintained by all and then ma'am yeah thank you thank you miss harmita and miss catherine uh, it was a refresher and uh, and a very informative session i would say and uh, teachers, I'm, I uh, sincerely encourage all of you to please, uh, you know, join the inclusions uh, community. Uh, 
and uh, do follow their page uh, believe me it twists uh, it twists uh, what uh, it's it's actually worth uh, worth attending all the sessions because i think i've been following i think since yeah. uh, more than a year more than a year yeah, or two, actually, i guess yeah. yeah 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 it's it's been a long journey and every time you you know whatever you want to know regarding inclusion the first update comes there mm -hmm. uh, so we do, we don't miss any of the sessions have you got yeah, your thank you so today? much Sorry, Catherine. Catherine, you have a forum today, don't you, on well-being? No, that is it's coming up next week on oh, the next seventh, week. I believe, the seventh. Yeah. We have a forum for inclusion and well-being for uh, kind of aimed more at counselors and head, heads of inclusion. But again, okay. it's open, all open and welcome. Everybody's welcome. And our forum next week is being led by Susie Hache, who is the lead counselor for GEMS Education. And she will be speaking all about addiction. So addiction in teenagers, middle school, high school. And we have seen a huge increase in addiction and a comorbidity of self-harm, which is very, very evident across our population. So that's what we will be looking at on the 7th, Monday the 7th at 5, 4 p.m. Okay, right. so uh, that's open yeah. to just, uh, I mean, just the teachers or because, you know, we do have, uh, is it open to students also or anyone can attend? I wouldn't advise students. Yeah. It's open. It's an open link. Anybody can join, but I wouldn't I think, advise students. Yeah, not students. I think it'd be better if the, if the counselors or even teachers, because remember, as teachers, we wear so many hats. Yeah. And, you know, one of them is definitely being, we are always counseling. So it would be a good session to attend. And hopefully with the uh, one of, I think after this session, the next one, the LSAs have actually uh, come forward and asked uh, if they can talk about the strategies that has worked for them. So I mm -hmm. think next forum, I'm going to try to put three uh, LSAs together and they will talk about their successes as um, uh, in the classroom. So what they've used. We also have newsletters uh, I think um, we have newsletters for um, the head of inclusions and we also have newsletters for LSAs. So yeah. my drive is empowering LSAs. I will be very honest. I really want to push them forward because I think they have been uh, undervalued this all these years. We need to push them forward because we have so much to learn from them. And of course, I'm always happy to support anybody from inclusion and it doesn't mean I know it all. I learned so much from all of you as well. It's just that I'm luckier because I've had a bit more exposure and time in the field of inclusion. And plus I'm crazy about it, so. <laughs> it's, a, it's a learning, uh, you know, we all learn every day, right? So every day we learn some of the other things, especially yeah. from children and from our coworkers, so yeah. Exactly, so always keep in mind, inclusion is never a destination. It's always a journey never a destination I like so that. you can keep going on this road and you'll never come to an end of it because it's never an end but it's always a journey and a learning journey guru harmeet has spoken <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen gets lots of this for me <laughs> So uh, once again, thank you so much for your time. And uh, we hope to have you back again with uh, some more uh, informative sessions in the future. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining in. You're welcome. Take care, thank everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.